This is Audible. Augusto Pinochet, The Life and Legacy of Chile's Controversial Dictator Written by Charles River Editors Narrated by Kenneth Ray Introduction Not a single leaf moves in this country if I'm not the one moving it. I want that to be clear. Pinochet For much of the twentieth century, South American countries, in large part, lived under a system of military junta governments. The mixture of indigenous peoples, foreign settlers, and European colonial superpowers produced cultural and social imbalances into which military forces intervened as a stabilizing influence. The proactive personalities of military heads and the rigid structures of such a hierarchy guaranteed the strong man, commanding officer, an abiding presence in the form of executive dictator. Such leaders often bore the more collaborative title of president, but the reality was in most cases identical. Likewise, the gap between rich and poor was often vast, and a disappearance of the middle class fed a frequent urge for revolution, re-energizing the military's intent to stop it. With no stabilizing center, the ideologies most prevalent in such conflicts alternated between a federal model of industrial and social nationalization and an equally conservative structure under privatized ownership and autocratic rule drawn from the head of a junta government. Whichever belief system was in play for the major industrial nations of the continent, a constant bombardment of foreign influence pushed the people of states such as Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and others toward overthrow in one direction or the other. From the left came Stalinist influences from the Soviet Union and Castro's Cuba, while the German World War II model and an anti-communist mindset from the United States worked behind the scenes to upset any movement toward extreme liberalism. The reign of Juan Perón in Argentina became the most iconic such arrangement to the Western observer, but General Augusto Pinochet's 17-year rule over Chile after an American-supported coup in the 1970s proved the most enduring and the most resistant to eradication by subsequent leaders of an opposite bent. Pinochet himself openly bragged, My library is filled with UN condemnations. By combating Marxists and communists during the Cold War, Pinochet ensured that he would at the very least remain undisturbed by America, even as he carried out policies that would be labeled tyrannical by any objective measurement. As writer Jacob C. Hornberger put it, while analyzing appraisals of Pinochet based on political background, "'Terror in the name of fighting terror is a grave criminal offense against humanity, no matter what economic philosophy the state terrorist happens to hold. Having achieved unusual longevity, and with new legal cases being opened well past his death in 2006, Pinochet has continued to play a part in Chilean politics through a vast array of unfinished business surrounding his political life. Indeed, nearly 30 years after Pinochet's reign ended, the Chilean dictator remains as controversial as ever, and he is often held out as the foremost example among critics of American intervention in the political affairs of other nations in the hemisphere. Augusto Pinochet, The Life and Legacy of Chile's Controversial Dictator, looks at the life of one of the most notorious Latin American leaders of the 20th century. Chapter 1. Early Years The man who would dominate life in Chile showed no signs of heightened ambition, and indeed his apparent lack of ideology may have been what led him to the presidential palace in Santiago. Born Augusto José Ramón Pinochet Ugarte on November 25, 1915, in Valparaiso, Pinochet was the eldest of six children. His father, Augusto, was of French ancestry and served as a relatively anonymous customs inspector. His mother, Vera Angelina Ugarte Martinez, of Basque descent, was similarly a middle-class government worker. Augusto Sr. never saw military action, and the couple assumed the quiet life of intellectuals. All signs pointed toward their son following a similarly non-military path. Pinochet was educated in large part by Marxist-oriented priests at the Rafael Aristia Institute, 
and his two attempts to enter military college both ended in rejection. He would later credit his upbringing in Catholic schools at the Institute and with the French Fathers' School in Valparaiso for his deepened understanding of regional and national politics. Eventually, it was Pinochet's mother who influenced her son to continue pursuit of a military career. His personal persistence, fed by such encouragement, finally opened the doors to the military school of Santiago in 1931, and he graduated in 1936 as a second lieutenant, having shown a good deal of military acumen not previously recognized by the higher-ups. As a commissioned officer, Pinochet gained several diverse appointments, which began with a 1937 stint in Concepcion. In 1940, he entered the military academy, but his studies were interrupted by a temporary assignment in the coastal region of Lota. Returning to the school in the next year, Pinochet was appointed chief of staff. On January 30, 1943, he married Lucia Hiriart, the daughter of an attorney and, by most accounts, a radical senator. In the same year, his daughter Inez Lucia was born. It is said that Lucia attached an imaginative sense of inspiration to her husband's pragmatism by likening him to Roman heroes such as Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus, who saved the state on two occasions. Her children, in fact, were named after similar historical figures, such as Augusto and Antonio. In time, Pinochet came to draw parallels between himself and Cincinnatus. Although not initially inspired to pursue a political or military path, Lucia purportedly possessed enough ambition for the two of them. 1948 saw Pinochet in his first executive position as commander of a regional prison camp. He later observed that it was during this tenure that he first began to lean significantly toward an anti-leftist ideology, citing a recognition of the truly diabolical attractions of Marxism. By 1951, Pinochet brought those right-oriented beliefs with him as a new instructor at the Military War Academy. His military training had taken him through several years of Prussian traditions of discipline, and the sanctity of a strong leadership hierarchy undoubtedly lent itself to the iron hand by which he later ruled the country. Included in such training was a maniacal loyalty to the national constitution— Events that shaped the year of 1953 exerted a powerful influence on Chile, beginning with the death of Joseph Stalin in Russia. The communist component of the people that held a minor plurality were overt in holding tributes to the iconic Soviet leader, no one more fervently than Salvador Allende, who had just mounted his first failed attempt of several to win the presidency. In his first of four runs, he finished last in a four-man race. Born in 1908, seven years before Pinochet, Salvador Isabelino del Sagrado Corazón de Jesús Allende Gossens co-founded the Chilean Socialist Party and represented a working-class constituency. Influenced in his youth by anarchist Juan de Marchi and others, he was arrested on several occasions during school days for speaking against the government before finally attaining his medical degree. Allende said of Marchi, when I was a boy, aged about fourteen or fifteen years, after the lessons at the high school of Valparaiso, I usually was going in the workshop of a shoemaker, Juan de Marchi, an Italian anarchist, by whom I was eager to stop exchanging opinions about foreign and national situation. De Marchi was aged sixty-three at the time, and he willingly agreed to talk to me about events of life. He even lent me his books, and furthermore, he taught me to play chess." By the late 1930s, Allende was appointed Minister of Health and served in the Senate on four occasions. It is said that at the death of Stalin he was all but uncontrollable. Taking advantage of collective emotion around the loss of such a Marxist figurehead, Allende and his followers followed in the revolutionaries' footsteps, declaring, We will employ revolutionary violence. In the ensuing months, Marxist death squads roamed Chile, with the intent of murdering bourgeois elements. Allende's profile as a Marxist presence grew, although he was temporarily expelled from the Socialist Party for accepting support from the illegal Communist Party. Chapter 2. Opposing Ideologies 
The freedoms, which had been so hard won from colonial domination, were being crushed by Soviet-inspired and funded military and political forces. Their clear intention was to deprive the people of their democratic freedoms. As history shows, this is what had happened in the Soviet Union and in Cuba, and continues to be the case in other parts of the world. Pinochet As Allende's fire for revolution increased, Pinochet went in quite the opposite direction, ideologically and geographically. In 1956, newly begun law studies were interrupted when he was chosen to aid in the establishment of a war college in Quito, Ecuador. He remained there for well over three years. The project stemmed from mutual interests that favored encroachment on land belonging to neighboring Peru. Chile had taken the formerly Peruvian Atacama Desert, rich in mineral resources, while Ecuador had taken much of their Amazonian forest. In Quito, Pinochet studied history, intelligence, geopolitics, and geography, writing prolifically on these and related subjects over time, including the texts used for the military academy. In addition to smaller efforts, he went on to author five books on politics and warfare, even producing a volume on the history of war in the Pacific, although one critic, whose politics are unknown, accused him of plagiarism. By the time Pinochet returned to Chile in 1959, however, the rise in power among the Marxist left stood in stark contrast to the increasingly conservative military officer who had become by all accounts a crack shot and held a black belt in karate. As Chile went left, Pinochet went right, leading a highly disciplined Prussian life devoid of smoking, drinking, or other stereotypically self-destructive behaviors, and he became a master soldier in the process. In 1963, he was appointed sub-director of the War Academy, and within the next five years, he so impressed the upper leadership of the Marxist government that he was promoted to brigadier general in 1968. In the run-up to the 1970 elections, the Marxists found themselves in a somewhat advantageous position. However, the possibility that they might take the presidency aroused the alarm of the Nixon administration in the U.S. Nixon, a notorious communist hunter within his own country, was legendary for his famous hearings, censures, imprisoning, and, in a rare case, executing Soviet sympathizers. Nixon's South American policies were based on a fear that should a Marxist government take control of Chile, it might create what he referred to as a red sandwich with Cuba. At that time, few constraints were put on national security organizations in the U.S., and foreign assassinations were acceptable within the view of the administration. Nixon, therefore, began a secretive campaign to destabilize the Chilean elections and to prevent an Allende victory. His instructions to the CIA were purportedly to make the Chilean economy scream. In addition to subversion of the Marxist platform, resources from the United States were to dry up at once. According to Ambassador Edward Corey, not a nut or bolt will be allowed to reach Chile under Allende. Pinochet's path finally crossed Allende's in 1970, when the Marxist cobbled together a sufficient plurality with which to win the Chilean presidency at last. In an unstable, ever-shifting dynamic within his own constituency, Allende held sway over a coalition of six political parties bonded together by a fragile consensus. While not constituting a government mandate with only 36% of the vote, Allende's forces nonetheless held a technical victory and were beginning to grow in popularity. Such a slave to duty was Pinochet that his seeming lack of rigidity on the conservative to liberal scale made him the perfect candidate for high-level security. Allende, believing that he could trust Pinochet above all officers of his rank, installed him as the commander of the Santiago garrison for the following three years. Despite Pinochet's evolution into a staunch conservative, his legendary discipline and loyalty to the existing constitution made him appear the least open to having his head turned by ideology. Further, with no protestations or signs of resistance coming forth from the new general, Pinochet gave the appearance of owning no particular passion for ideology at all. He was a military man, and thus served the master who appointed him. Chapter 3. The Coup The armed forces 
have acted today solely from the patriotic inspiration of saving the country from the tremendous chaos into which it was being plunged by the Marxist government of Salvador Allende. The Junta will maintain judicial power and consultantship of the Comptroller. The chambers will remain in recess until further orders. That is all. Pinochet, after the coup. In the beginning, such a notion seemed to bear itself out. Pinochet, as Allende's man, dutifully put down opposition to the Marxist leader wherever it could be found. He imposed curfews set by the president, and he arrested anyone who broke them, regardless of affiliation. As Pinochet put it, I will not tolerate agents of chaos, no matter what their political ideology. Allende was most impressed by his new protector's seemingly neutral stance, and such a perception brought Pinochet a promotion to general under the left-wing Popular Unity government, a strange landing place for a newly formed conservative. Still, Pinochet did, over time, manage to assassinate several figures from Allende's circle early on in the new position, and whether all the orders came from Allende himself is doubtful. Allende's swift moves toward nationalization and his anti-private business habits must have alarmed Pinochet, but he did not reveal it outwardly. Opposed by virtually all business interests in Chile, Allende made good on wage increases of up to 40 percent, and companies were not allowed to raise prices. The sweeping nationalization of industry under Allende included major foreign interests, such as U.S. copper mines, and in matters of foreign policy, he re-established relations with Cuba, China, and the German Democratic Republic. Despite warnings from leaders such as China's Zhou Enlai that he was moving too quickly toward pure communism, Allende did not slow his pace. Whatever effect this might have had on the Chilean people, the U.S. administration was prepared to move far more quickly in coaxing a revolution as quickly as possible. It was said in hindsight by some that in the days of Allende the rule of law prospered, but in real political terms that might not have been the case. Regardless, the United States was not particularly concerned with the rule of law, but the backsliding of a major South American power falling into communism, with Stalin and Castro as its founding fathers. Rhetoric coming out of Washington was alarmist, but the greatest threats were more covert than public. That work was for clandestine groups at the president's immediate disposal. The U.S. sent operative Michael V. Townley to Chile under the alias of Kenneth W. Inyard, with the purpose of disrupting the Allende government in any way possible. Townley was accompanied by Aldo Vera Serafin, an experienced fellow agitator. In a real sense, Townley, a skilled assassin for hire, was already a fit in Chile's structure. Having moved there with his family from Waterloo, Iowa, where he was born, his father was the head of Ford Motor Company in Santiago. Once settled, he worked for Chilean intelligence before forging a strong link with the CIA. Townley also carried on an alliance with the Cuban group Chicago Junta, which disbanded the day before the JFK assassination. Townley operated under strict instructions from Secretary of State Kissinger to force a coup upon the minds of conspirators and the people at the earliest date possible, but to hide the American hand at all costs. The operatives were given enough resources to command a task force specifically devoted to bringing down the presidency of Salvador Allende. Those who were deemed uncooperative among the Chilean staff, even upper-level military men in their home country, were vulnerable to attack by the U.S.-installed agitation group. General René Schneider, chief of staff for Pinochet, was approached about assisting in a coup against Allende, but refused. On October 22, 1970, Schneider's car was ambushed, and he was shot multiple times, dying soon after in the hospital. If the U.S. was alarmed at the idea of a communist takeover of Chile, they were not seeing phantom threats. Only weeks before the coup of September 11, 1973, Chile was filled with both Cuban and Soviet operatives. Virtually hundreds of KGB personnel were traced and identified where possible. With full knowledge of the foreign Marxist presence in his home country and an absolute awareness of the available resources of the United States, Pinochet's course of action was confirmed. 
To his conservative mind, the Chilean population was looking up the locked and loaded muzzle of a Stalinist takeover. To Pinochet's advantage, Allende appointed him commander of the army on August 23, 1973. It was the general custom in Chilean politics that the armed forces stand aside from political crises, but the breaking point was reached by an insistent Pinochet who was appalled by the shattered economy and the sight of people in the streets. He believed that Chile stood at the crossroads of an all-encompassing civil war should the Marxist forces carry the election, and many agreed that the country faced a preemptory or imminent loss of human lives between half a million to one million should the election go unchecked. Pinochet's fears of such an internal conflict and a foreign-led military intervention were not overestimated. In an affair known as the Cuban Packages, an illegal smuggling operation conducted through several of Allende's ministers, gifts began to arrive from Fidel Castro. Flown in by Cubana de Aviación in two installments per week and hidden in diplomatic pouches were caches of automatic arms, grenades, and ammunition flowing to a small revolutionary army. During the three weeks following Pinochet's appointment as commander of the army, U.S. operatives, such as Townley, continued to do their work in resistance to an election favoring the Marxist government. The covert task force undermined the sitting administration in every way it could, most effectively through strikes in the trucking industry. Allende's government was helpless to control the expropriations of land with such entities operating on their own. The nationalization of foreign copper interests had been a major issue of the presidential campaign, resulting in a constitutional amendment passed by unanimous vote. The crippling strikes, sparked by the U.S. task force, withheld the land and the industry from Allende's reach. On September 11, 1973, the bloody revolution in Chile began, as the usually passive army began to shell the Moneda Palace, the residence and office location of the Chilean presidency. Pinochet ordered and publicly led the shelling, even with the president inside the walls. Unable to access his covert units for rescue, Allende made one final radio broadcast, described by one observer as heartbreaking, from the besieged palace. In it, Allende stated, The Grand Avenue will open again, through which free men will pass to build a better society. A short while after, Allende died of a fatal gunshot wound. Arguments, after the fact, have contested the manner of his death, but Allende's personal physician testified that the president committed suicide, and that claim has come to be the general consensus. Either way, Allende, the Marxist who had promised to lead Chile down the democratic road to socialism by way of duplicating a Soviet and Cuban model, gave way to a revolution comprised of renegade military forces led by Augusto Pinochet, covert foreign groups agitating within Chilean conservative elements and spurred on by dire economic conditions. The coup of September 11 took little time to complete, and resistance to Pinochet's action throughout the country was negligible. In radio broadcasts, he claimed without hesitation that a combination of socialist and communist forces, political and paramilitary, had joined in a coalition to take over Chile, and that the only available solution was an authoritarian government that has the capacity to act decisively. The institution of political parties was immediately banned, and they would not return for at least a generation. Labor unions suffered the same fate, and strikes of any kind were forbidden. Trusted military officers were disposed throughout the country to serve as mayors of villages and towns, and up to 10% of the judiciary members were dismissed from their posts for representing liberal positions. The beginnings of an arms industry in Chile was personally established in the coup's aftermath. Chapter 4 The Junta I am going to die. The person who succeeds me also would die. But elections you won't have. Pinochet Named to a four-man military junta in the form of a governing council to lead the country, Pinochet was soon established as the most powerful of the four military branch heads and as the junta's spokesman. With the country attuned to his voice, he initiated an immediate clampdown on the Chilean Communist Party, 
claiming that Allende had for all intents and purposes held a permanent spot on the Soviet payroll, for which he should be formally condemned and exposed for systematically destroying democracy. Part of the revelation was the Chamber of Deputies' claim that Allende had supported covert armed groups, had committed torture against political opponents among the people, had conducted illegal arrests, had rendered the press mute from the local to the national level, had confiscated private property for the purpose of nationalization, and had forbidden people to leave the country based on their ideological persuasion. A vigilant Pinochet instituted the habit of micromanaging political and cultural affairs down to the local level. He monitored the arts and even barred motion pictures such as Fiddler on the Roof, because, at least in his view, the film portrayed Russia in too kindly a light. In his obsessive hovering over all matters, he was fond of saying, Not a leaf in Chile moves without my knowing it. Pinochet's coup and subsequent government was not only a move against the spread of communism in Chile, he expressed a similar distaste for what he termed orthodox democracy as well, which he described as being too easy to infiltrate and destroy. Within days of the coup at Moneda Palace, a series of purges were set in motion under Pinochet's direct orders. The most iconic of these actions was termed the Caravan of Death, a widespread dragnet executing prisoners already held in numerous provincial villages. Pinochet dispatched a delegation of military men to the provinces, both in the north and the south. He was said to have been personally annoyed by soft commanders allowing the legal process to drag on with their prisoners. Under the direction of General Sergio Ariano Stark, the action was, in Pinochet's words, dedicated to imposing a uniform criteria in the administering of justice for prisoners. Stark was instructed to bring an end to the remaining legal processes and to offer no mercy for extremists. Among the earliest arrivals of the caravan was in the town of Antofagasta on October 19th, a little over a month after the coup. A total of 14 prisoners were executed by firing squad and left in a shallow mass grave. Through the month of October, 16 additional towns were visited, with a total of 97 prisoners killed. Once the coup was complete, Pinochet handed a list of 71 names to General Stark and ordered him to guarantee their elimination. The caravan of death proceeded from town to town by helicopter, and names of those eliminated were crossed off Pinochet's list within a matter of days. New prisoners were taken in large numbers, beginning a three-year regimen of torture and executions, and held in every conceivable venue. The national stadium itself was converted into a publicly overt prison camp. Military bases and naval ships were used as slaughterhouses for those on the wrong side of the Marxist conservative question, and bodies were routinely dumped in mine shafts, unmarked graves, and along the coastline into the Pacific Ocean. During this time, the term disappearing someone caught on as a catchphrase. On the naval ship Esmeralda, a 400-foot-long, four-masted boat, well over a hundred prisoners were detained, including 40 women. The ship was launched in the early 50s as a naval training vessel, but after 1973, a wide array of torture was employed on board, including rape, electric shock, mock executions, and severe beatings. A British-Chilean priest, Father Michael Woodward, was taken off the vessel and tortured separately from the rest. He died in transit to the local hospital and was believed to have been buried in a mass grave under the road leading away from the port. Said one victim, They tortured people with no sentiment. They enjoyed it. Those directly inflicting the torture were caught up in the delirium and often dressed in party regalia, wearing black masks. Chapter 5. President Pinochet The country is safe because we have a good intelligence service. Pinochet We practically wipe this nation clean of Marxists. Pinochet By the early summer of 1974, little doubt remained as to Pinochet's supremacy over his fellow junta leaders. 
When he assumed the Chilean presidency in June of that year, the junta became little more than an advisory body. In the midst of the ongoing hunt for opponents, Pinochet made broad moves to sweep away all vestiges of the Allende regime by ending nationalization in almost all forms, privatizing the country's social security system, and returning land to private parties. Marxist economic policies were scrapped in favor of free trade politics. Having studied the works of Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago, Pinochet surrounded himself with a group of young Chilean economists who had spent time as devotees at Friedman's feet. These came to be known collectively as the Chicago Boys, and he gave them almost free reign in recasting the Chilean economy in Friedman's image. For his part, Friedman would later say, I have nothing good to say about the political regime that Pinochet imposed. It was a terrible political regime. The real miracle of Chile is not how well it has done economically. The real miracle of Chile is that a military junta was willing to go against its principles and support a free market regime designed by principled believers in a free market. In Chile, the drive for political freedom that was generated by economic freedom and the resulting economic success ultimately resulted in a referendum that introduced political democracy. As the new head of government in Chile, Pinochet also ensured a big rise in the numbers of arrests and executions. Some accounts claim that up to 10,000 Chilean citizens were victimized by the purges and that up to 130,000 arrests were made shortly after the coup. Most of the killings reportedly took place within the first three months, but the habit of executing prisoners taken from slums or agrarian communities for the purpose of frightening their neighbors continued. People were arbitrarily taken out of the villages and murdered in one way or another, often cynically and falsely, in order to fulfill a largely unknown quota. The national stadium swelled to full capacity, and of the thousands taken there, the famous protest singer Victor Jara was one, presumably executed with a group of others in late 1973. The most employed excuse for executions in remote areas was that the prisoner was shot while attempting to escape. It became clear that operatives from the United States were still in Chile following the overthrow and turning to other work for which they were originally engaged. Michael Townsley's services for the Pinochet cause continued as an assassin tracking down dissidents, some high level, who had fled Chile during the coup. Staging an auto-bombing in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Townley and his group assassinated Chilean General Carlos Prats and his wife on September 30, 1973, and they very likely organized the assassination of former Chilean minister Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C. Long after Townley's work was finished, others were serving life sentences in Chile. He, however, was freed and entered into a witness protection program in the United States. It is widely speculated that he is still alive. Townley, in retrospect, was discovered to be but a small part of a continent-wide operation involving numerous powers in South America. With its birthplace in Paraguay, a multinational intelligence organization spread through lower South America as one state after another fell to military dictatorships. Most of Pinochet's activity, chasing escaped dissidents, occurred between the years of 1975 and 1977. He made extensive use of what came to be known as Operation Condor, a cooperative extradition agreement between fellow military states dedicated to the suppression of leftists in all walks of society. Dissidents were tracked, caught, tortured, and either killed or returned to their respective countries where they faced almost certain execution. Operation Condor is regarded in retrospect as an enormous human rights crime wave perpetrated on the continent. The mass disappearance of an enormous cross-section of South American society ensued from the dumping of bodies in makeshift crematoriums, mass graves at sea, drugged prisoners dumped out of helicopters, to name but a few of the atrocities committed. U.S. documents reveal much information on the bilateral arrangements between South American nations to track and kill opponents. 
Despite taking part in a high-profile auto bombing in Washington, D.C., dangerous due to the risk of America's depth of involvement being discovered, General Manuel Contreras, one of Pinochet's right-hand men, was kept on as a major liaison with the CIA, eventually becoming a paid asset. Further investigation revealed that the CIA paid a sum of $35,000 to Townley's group of assassins after they murdered General René Schneider, not as payment for the job or as an enlistment for a new one, but merely to keep the prior contract secret and maintain the goodwill of the group. The CIA did not work in a void. In the destructive first phase following the coup, the Dirección de Inteligencia Nacional was established in 1974. DINA became the Chilean secret police, with an overall purpose of coordinating the hunt for dissidents with similar organizations in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Brazil, and other neighboring states. This flexible and covert organization was also designed to efficiently coordinate activities between the military branches and to oversee the general policies of Pinochet, including censorship over the media, the purging of universities, and the prevention of political parties or unions. General Contreras served as the organizational director, which put him in the collaborative network with the CIA. In an initial three-year tenure, Dina had much work to do throughout the continent, as approximately 200,000 individuals had fled the country in the first weeks following Pinochet's coup. While Operation Condor became the most iconic of Dina's projects, other actions, such as Operation Colombo, in which 119 disappeared, were common. As with the case of Colombo, a typical Dina habit was to publish information throughout neighboring states that these victims had died fighting guerrillas. At the time, the Chilean media and larger external news organizations remained almost entirely silent. After files were declassified, one historian analyzing the documents wrote about Dina's activities. In some camps, routine sadism was taken to extremes. At Via Grimaldi, recalcitrant prisoners were dragged to a parking lot. Dina agents then used a car or truck to run over and crush their legs. Prisoners there recalled one young man who was beaten with chains and left to die slowly from internal injuries. Rape was also a recurring form of abuse. Dina officers subjected female prisoners to grotesque forms of sexual torture that included insertion of rodents and, as tactfully described in the commission report, unnatural acts involving dogs. On December 11, 1974, Pinochet took on the title of the presidency and assumed full powers by June of that summer. Leaving the junta behind in terms of real decision-making, his fellow military heads became more of an advisory and at times enforcement body. The goal was unanimously shared to reassert free market policies, end nationalization wherever it exists, and to exterminate leftism. Pinochet advocated a regime of lower taxes, sold off virtually all of the state-run businesses, and created every favorable condition possible for increased foreign investment. In the short term, such an approach created what most called the miracle of Chile, a period of two to three years that featured a booming economy. The brief period of prosperity has been called into question by some as the same phenomenon created a drop in wages and a spike in unemployment as well. Even in the beginning of the new government, reversing Allende's policies and rounding up dissidents, little proactive work could be done on Chile's cultural and economic future. Still, the coming boom did begin to take shape in small increments through the first year. Dina's work continued under Pinochet's vigilance as he turned to rebuild the social and economic structure of the country. Activities of the secret police were not restricted to the South American continent, and dissidents were pursued in Europe and the United States as well. Bernardo Leighton, the son of a Chilean judge and former minister of previous governments, was placed in Pinochet's list after he criticized the military leadership. Leighton and his wife went into exile in Italy. At an unspecified date in 1975, Michael Townley met with Italian terrorist Stefano de Le Chiaie 
in a collaboration between Dina and Franco's secret police in Spain, resulting in the attempted assassination of Leighton in Rome. While they were not killed, Leighton and his wife were severely injured by multiple gunshots, and she became a paraplegic. Leighton suffered brain damage to the point that his career as an anti-Pinochet activist was finished, and he was even allowed to return home three years later. The assassination of leading Pinochet opponent Orlando Letelier is perhaps the most well-known Dina action taken in the years after the coup. Letelier had spent a year in various Chilean concentration camps, where he was repeatedly tortured. Following that, he was committed to eight months in political prison and was only released and allowed to leave the country after Pinochet was pressured by prominent figures such as Diego Arna, governor of Caracas, Venezuela, and others. He was told by his releasing officer not to assume that he would be safe out of the country, and was warned that the arm of the Dina is long. Letelier relocated to the U.S. and joined the think tank Institute for Policy Studies, lobbying the U.S. Congress against Pinochet. At one point, the new Chilean president signed an order revoking Letelier's nationality. On the morning of September 21, 1976, as Letelier drove to work with his assistant, Michael Moffat, and Michael's wife, Ronnie, in the American capital, a car bomb detonated at 9.30 a.m. Letelier and Ronnie Moffat were taken to the hospital, where both died. Michael escaped out the rear of the automobile. Through the mayhem of the revolution's first two years, Pinochet is retroactively seen by many as the antagonist and the creator of the general scenario. Respected analysts, however, characterize Pinochet as a natural outgrowth of an existing and unsustainable situation. By 1973, Chile is said to have been beset by a confused utopian left, an inflexible, short-sighted center, and an uncompromising, selfish right. With the term democracy as a workable concept in either a socialistic or conservative framework, the coup that overthrew Allende was carried out against one of the longest-standing democracies in the region, one with the pre-existing conditions for precisely what Pinochet provided. His methods have been described as gratuitously barbaric, but offensively successful. But it is largely agreed that as a symbol of the revolution, he summed up the faults of a generation. By the third year of the revolution, Pinochet must have felt comfortable enough with his public favorability rating of over 75% to relax on some points. That year, a subtle change of mood overtook the government, accompanied by modest political liberalization. Nearing the end of the coup's most brutal aftermath, the purges began to taper somewhat in 1978, and Pinochet was able to move forward at an accelerated rate. Even the Dina was disbanded, although it was re-established under another name, La Central Nacional de Informaciones. Those who aided in the abuse of dissidents did not fit with Pinochet's larger Chilean picture so well as they once had, especially since the FBI involved itself with the Letelier assassination in Washington. When George H. W. Bush was told that Americans were involved, he leaked a story to Operation Mockingbird to cover up the CIA's role. Mockingbird, a media-controlled project by the CIA, had been in place for a quarter of a century, with recruited individuals placed within major news outlets. With the American cover now in some danger, military aid to Chile was suspended for several years, and Chile was condemned in the United Nations and European Union. For Chile's part, Pinochet agreed to pay some restitution to the U.S., but he never admitted open complicity. As the FBI made progress, Chile decided to extradite Townley to the U.S. The assassin, originally hired by the U.S. government, confessed that he had hired five anti-Castro-Cuban exiles to bomb Letelier's car. All five accomplices were indicted, and Townley, who was to be convicted in the bombing, implicated General Contreras and General Pedro Espinosa, Dina's director of operations. It was Espinosa who admitted under much pressure that Pinochet was personally involved in the attacks. Contreras and Espinosa went to prison in Chile. Despite some public enlightenment on what had transpired in the preceding three years, the covert CIA involvement continued, 
with over 400 operatives working in Chile and assisting in the privatization of the social and welfare system. Pinochet set strict limits on economic policy, refusing to return in any way to statist measures. However, similarly to the way in which the Marxist plan had failed, so did the conservative approach in a widening gap between the rich and poor, often a precursor to social upheaval. The wealth gap rivaled only Brazil on the South American continent. No one could act to balance Pinochet's view, since political parties were still forbidden, and Congress was dissolved. The 1925 Constitution was scrapped for another to be installed in 1980. The new Constitution would undergo far-reaching revisions throughout the following decade, but for the time being solidified Pinochet's power in the country, guaranteeing that he would remain in the presidency for eight more years. At that time, a plebiscite, a national referendum on his continued tenure in office, was to be held. It guaranteed a gradual and legal path toward democracy and installed a binomial electoral process, but provided amnesty laws for all military officials. The junta's power was sustained under new terminology as political arbiters, guarantors of institutionality. The Constitution's legitimacy was to be questioned from all sides, since the spectrum of Chilean political views was not consulted by the President. Chapter 6 The 1980s This is not a dictadura, dictatorship or hard rule, but a dicta blanda, soft rule. Pinochet Sworn in again on March 11, 1981, Pinochet took immediate steps to establish private pension accounts, one of the first governments to do so. After a three-year period of deep recession that ended in 1983, soup lines began to disappear. The gross national product rose toward the 6% mark during the miracle of Chile, thanks in part to leverage exerted by the U.S. over Pinochet. Chile simultaneously experienced a drastic drop in infant mortality during those years. The economic boom, however, almost never got its chance, as widespread protests and rioting broke out in 1983, and films such as Missing were released, the story of two Americans among the disappeared, Charles Horman and Frank Teruji. Nationwide protests brought on another wave of repression, as Pinochet responded with strong aggression. In 1986, despite the economic upturn, old resistance groups who had withstood the purges reemerged, such as the Manuel Rodriguez Patriotic Front, the FPMR, or El Frente. Named for a hero of the Chilean War of Independence, the organization was formerly the military component of the Chilean Communist Party. An assassination attempt was made on Pinochet in 1986 as he was driven from his country home. The car was ambushed, but Pinochet's driver sped off in reverse, eluding the conspirators, and Pinochet was unharmed. The incident cost the lives of five bodyguards with twenty-two wounded. In retaliation, Pinochet's police arbitrarily abducted four communist-leaning citizens from their homes, killing all four. The failed assassination threw El Frente into a state of internal crisis, and the organization announced in the same year that it would abandon peaceful protest in favor of violent opposition through sabotage, despite their small membership. Chilean communist leader Volodya Teitelboim announced on Radio Moscow that 1986 would become the year of titanic battles. One such projected collision included a general strike on July 2, 1986, in which an army patrol retaliated by seizing Rodrigo Rojas, an 18-year-old photographer and son of an exiled Chilean mother with whom he had been recently reunited in the U.S. Also attacked was Carmen Quintana, 19, an engineering student at the University of Santiago. Both were set on fire. They were found by agricultural workers and taken to the nearest hospital, where Rojas died four days later. The Pinochet story is that they were accidentally set ablaze by Molotov cocktails thrown by communist protesters. Medical reports, however, showed that Rojas had broken ribs, a fractured mandible, and a collapsed lung as well. Quintana survived the attack 
and lived to receive a blessing from Pope John Paul II when he visited Chile the following year. An army captain was sentenced some time later for the burnings and spent three hundred days in prison, but no further actions were taken. By 1988, the obligatory plebiscite spelled out in the Constitution drew near, and it was begrudgingly fulfilled by President Pinochet. The general was confident in the affections of his citizenry and pleased with his accomplishments of the past fifteen years, thinking that he would do well at the ballot box. As special favors to those who sought some relaxation of presidential rigidity, he signed a bill restoring political parties. However, on October 5, 1989, he was disappointed to learn that he had garnered no more than 43 percent of the vote and would soon be turned out of office. He bitterly declined all shows of support for a candidacy in the next election. Later that year, Pinochet turned the presidency over to Patricio Ailwen, a Christian Democrat. The results of the plebiscite were a shock to Pinochet, as he was certain that his country would not move leftward after what had happened almost two decades before. However, he failed to take into account that many were too young to remember the Allende years, and had become too confident in the economy to believe that only an authoritarian government could provide stability. Similarly, he failed to notice that among the populace the sense of obligation toward the act of voting had risen significantly, and that the move for a change snowballed in the sense of citizen participation. The leader who thought his 1980 constitution was a new gift to the people must surely have noticed that the U.S. Embassy was no longer chiming in with the criticisms of dissidents, and, as embassy personnel pointed out in retrospect, he hated and mistrusted us, but some elements in his government were moderating their stance. Noteworthy as well is that two of the normally acquiescent junta leaders suddenly asserted themselves, barring Pinochet from backing out of the constitutional obligation to put his presidential popularity to the test. Chapter 7 Pinochet's Final Years I have lived with my conscience and my memories for over a quarter of a century since the events of 1973. These are not easy reflections for me, but I am at peace with myself and with the Chilean people about what happened. I am clear in my mind that the return to Chile of true democracy and from that true freedom to which all individual people are entitled could not have been achieved without the removal of the Marxist government. Pinochet He shut down Parliament, suffocated political life, banned trade unions, and made Chile his sultanate. His government disappeared 3,000 opponents, arrested 30,000, torturing thousands of them, Pinochet's name will forever be linked to the desaparecidos, the caravan of death, and the institutionalized torture that took place in the Villa Grimaldi complex. Thor Halverson, President of the Human Rights Foundation It was all but inevitable that the subsequent term of Patricio Ailwen would include investigations into the former regime. Moving quickly to establish the National Committee on Truth and Reconciliation, Data was collected on the first of the Pinochet victims, including names and details of deaths, firing squads, beatings, humiliations, drownings, and electrocutions. When one of the first mass graves was discovered, Pinochet scoffed at the accusation, telling the press that mass graves are an efficient manner of burial. The first of several investigations into charges of financial corruption against Pinochet took place in late 1990, as the committee looked into what has been called the Pinocheques affair. Three checks made out to the eldest son of Pinochet, totaling three million dollars, were claimed to represent the sale of Valmoval, a small arms company with Swiss roots. Pinochet's name was not listed under the company's books, and he had no apparent connection with the company in any official capacity. The weapons sales were intended for the Chilean army, where the elder Pinochet still carried significant clout. In December, he strode into army headquarters and placed the 57,000-man force under alert and only then asked for an end to the investigation. When Pinochet occupied the presidency, he was able to easily thwart legal threats to his security forces. Even as he slipped into his controversial new role as Senator for Life, as the Constitution guaranteed, 
protecting his former agents became more difficult. In 1992, an immense discovery was made by Dr. Martin Almada, a human rights activist, and Judge José Augustín Fernández at a police station in Asuncion, Paraguay. Fernández was searching for the file of one prisoner, but chanced upon an accounting of the entire operation. The array of uncovered papers documented the names and fates of many thousands of victims, not only in Chile under Pinochet, but in collaborating governments. They clearly showed that Paraguay was involved with the inception of Operation Condor and included much of the continent as accomplice states, Chile, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. All in all, data points to approximately 50,000 murders, with over 30,000 unaccounted for and almost half a million imprisoned during the height of the operation. The files, collectively, came to be known as the Archives of Terror and would play a significant part in later cases filed against Pinochet. The presidency was again open to election in 1993, and, to Pinochet's disappointment, another Christian Democrat, Eduardo Fry Ruiz Tagle, won by an even greater margin than had Alwyn. The economy of the time had achieved relative stability, and foreign investments were booming. Discretion being the better part of valor, the left generally declined to tinker with what was presently successful. In the words of the finance minister Alejandro Foxley, no one in the present administration had any love for the Pinochet years, even if it was admitted that they did many things right. 1998 was the year the Communist Party of Chile filed the first human rights violation case against Pinochet. On March 10th, Pinochet stepped down as commander of the army, enjoying one of few moments of adoration from the old days. During a commemorative ceremony, the band played his favorite song, a German World War II ballad entitled Lily Marlene. However, Pinochet's arrival at the Senate chamber, where he sought to take advantage of his constitutional rights as a lifelong member, was far less adoring. Usually a mere formality, Pinochet's entrance to the floor was met with fistfights breaking out among opposing members and chants of assassin coming from the gallery seats. From that point forward, new investigations were launched almost daily, and in 1999 his role in the Letelier assassination was uncovered. Six people were arrested for the bombing, but not Pinochet. For the former president, it was the perfect time for an overseas goodwill tour, and no one at the time appreciated him any more than Margaret Thatcher's Britain. On the former president's infamous trip to the UK, he was welcomed by virtually all in government and hosted lavishly by the prime minister. Chile had been more than helpful in the British military action in the Falkland Islands and was in some ways essential to Thatcher's victory there. The two sipped tea together in the afternoon and shopped at Harrods, as Pinochet's trip was undertaken in a light-hearted tone. From time to time, he sent Thatcher chocolate and flowers, and failed to see any reason why such a welcome should be short-lived. The purpose of Pinochet's time in the UK was not entirely for pleasure, as he required a back operation, and he was hospitalized in London for a time. What he did not expect was an intervention by agents of Scotland Yard, who entered the hospital on October 16th to arrest him, on the basis of a human rights violation claim filed in another country. A claim of extradition was made upon the British government by Judge Baltazar Garçon of Spain, on the grounds that Pinochet had violated the human rights of a number of Spanish citizens in Chile during the years of his presidency. Specifically, Garçon charged Pinochet with the kidnapping of 19 Allende supporters from Spain, creating a worldwide controversy and endless debate over a single official's right to bring a head of state to trial in a country other than his own. Ordinarily, Britain would have been under no legal mandate to obey such a request, but it had signed on with the United Nations Convention Against Torture, an agreement ratified by most of the world. By acceptance of those same countries, the agreement carried universal jurisdiction that superseded any claim of immunity by a head of state. The original agreement was intended to simplify the procedure so that the extradition process itself would not be bogged down, with details of evidence to be saved for the ensuing trial. 
Therefore, Spain was not required to present a prima facie case in order to extradite Pinochet to Madrid, even though most of the accumulated charges had little or nothing to do with Spain. The Pinochet arrest became a sensational news item throughout the world, and the debate was endless, as if the case represented a tectonic shift in the budding field of international law surrounding human rights cases. Human rights organizations were globally galvanized, especially in Chile. The United States and other countries were heavily lobbied to give up classified status on their documents surrounding the Allende overthrow, with all of its ensuing operations. For Pinochet, the extradition request resulted in over 500 days under house arrest, while the British court system analyzed and reanalyzed Spain's claim. Tensions mounted in Chile between Britain and Pinochet supporters, and for Thatcher's government, the relationship of the late 90s was an uncomfortable one. Later in 1998, five law lords reached the conclusion that Pinochet should be stripped of his immunity, ostensibly agreeing with Spain. That ruling, however, was set aside when one of the lords was found to be linked with the Amnesty International Organization, rendering the panel's decision moot. In 1999, a panel of seven judges voted six to one that Pinochet should be extradited, but that he should not be prosecuted for any charges that occurred before 1988. Before extradition was enacted, however, Pinochet was declared mentally unfit for trial, and Home Secretary Jack Straw eventually released him for a return to Chile on compassionate grounds. In a sense, being released to return home was anything but compassionate. Not only had the case with Spain become a locus classicus for the new human rights legislation and an outcry among victims for justice, but the formal authority Pinochet had once enjoyed was no longer a feature of the political culture established by his successors. Upon his release on March 2, 2000, and his return to Chilean shores, over 600 cases were filed against him. Opponents, who had lacked the power a few years before, attacked him openly, as having a complete disregard for human rights. They sought to further expose his role in the Letelier assassination in Washington, and publicly reveal the details of Operation Colombo, in which over 100 Chilean leftists disappeared in the second year after the coup. The British court believed that in its verdict declaring Pinochet too feeble for a trial, it was allowing the former dictator, now physically and mentally spent, the right to return home to die. However, the Chilean government's perception of the returning Pinochet was shockingly contrary, as the dictator seemed re-energized. According to one observer, he rose from his wheelchair and cast away his stick. Once declared fit, he agreed to address all of the judge's questions. Only days after his return, however, Pinochet suffered further disappointment, as Ricardo Lagos assumed office, the first socialist to preside over Chile since Salvador Allende. Shortly after that, Pinochet was stripped of his immunity from prosecution as a former president, and once he resigned his life term in the Senate, he was all but legally defenseless. After having returned to Chile, Pinochet was not immune from further foreign actions. In the same manner that Spain had sought him for extradition, France, Switzerland, and other states announced actions against him. Pinochet continued to serve as a new metaphor for extradition law. Legal analysts debated whether an individual court pursuing a head of state for alleged crimes against humanity would cause dictators to suffer a more limited range of movement in order to avoid prosecution. The first actual indictment of Pinochet was brought by Judge Juan Guzman in a charge of human rights violations. The court's efforts stalled as Pinochet's health made prosecution seem impossible at the time. Under house arrest for several periods, some lengthy, he suffered the humiliation of reporting to the police for mugshots, fingerprinting, and to be registered as a criminal. Still, through periods of detention, sometimes lasting up to six weeks, he managed to avoid trial. One legal rescue was still available, albeit tenuous. An amnesty law passed in Chile over twenty years prior protected Pinochet from any violations occurring between 1973, the year of the coup, through 1978. Providing such a law was respected by the government of 2001, 
the worst three years of Pinochet's abuses could be removed from consideration. In 2002, the first round of charges were dropped, as Pinochet was deemed mentally incapable of defending himself. The court accepted a diagnosis of vascular dementia, and Pinochet was once again released. By 2003, American secrecy on operations in Chile began to unravel. The human rights-oriented administrations of Carter and Clinton supported internal investigations, and in that year, General Colin Powell remarked, It's not a part of American history we are proud of. In June of 2004, when the results of a U.S. Senate investigation were released, leftist Chileans were outraged. It was revealed that during many years of dire poverty among the citizenry, Pinochet had amassed a fortune in foreign bank accounts, including banks in Europe and the United States, such as the Riggs Bank of Washington. As more information came to light, the figure of Pinochet's accumulated wealth stashed away in secret accounts exceeded $28 million. Based on these findings, Pinochet was again charged, this time with tax evasion, and the court reversed its own ruling on the state of his health. A new rash of court filings followed at a rapid pace as plaintiffs lined up in the hope of being heard before the defendant died. Pinochet's immunity continued to be stripped away, and he was deemed open to prosecution for the death of General Carlos Platz and his wife. At the end of 2004, a new round of human rights charges were prepared as the National Committee on Political Imprisonment and Torture confirmed at least 35,000 cases of such abuse. In 2005, the Chilean Supreme Court removed Pinochet's immunity from illegal financial dealings, and in a blow to the amnesty law upon which he relied for protection, the court did the same in the case of 119 disappearances. Ascribed to Pinochet's direct orders, bodies of the victims were found two years after the overthrow of Allende in neighboring Argentina. The financial scandal, triggered by discovery of Pinochet's foreign accounts, expanded to his entire family in 2005, and his wife Lucia was charged with tax evasion by the Chilean Internal Revenue Service, along with his son Antonio. In time, every member of the immediate family was met with the same charge. Judge Sergio Munoz demanded that Pinochet's wife remain under detention at Santiago Military Hospital. While the financial activities were under investigation, a parallel charge of false use of passports remained pending. The final period of house arrest for Pinochet lasted up to one month before his death, as the court prepared to proceed on murder charges involving two Allende bodyguards. During this period, he celebrated his 91st birthday, with an elaborate party thrown by a small group of supporters who would celebrate important anniversaries with him, including that of the Allende coup. He occasionally spoke at luncheons, but mostly remained closeted in his country home 80 miles from Santiago. He had lost the heart of the military and was scorned by former military colleagues and conservative civilian ideologues. Even at the end of his life, he maintained a flair for fashion and was likened to Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi by the small circle of friends who pined for the old days of the 70s. Michel Bachelet was voted into office in 2006. Another socialist president, she was, as her predecessors had been, faced with the question of whether to prosecute Pinochet and his family. Her father had been a general in the Air Force and was loyal to Allende. Under Pinochet, he was tortured and died in prison. Over half of the Chilean population believed that even in such a feeble and politically irrelevant state, Pinochet should be prosecuted. The government and media watched for any sign of remorse or request for forgiveness in his last days, but the closest Pinochet ever came to such an admission was a statement that he was responsible for the actions of his government. Until the end of his life, Pinochet remained defiant. Weeks before his death, he insisted, Today, near the end of my days, I want to say that I harbor no rancor against anybody, that I love my fatherland above all, and that I take political responsibility for everything that was done which had no other goal than making Chile greater and avoiding its disintegration. I assume full political responsibility for what happened. In fact, instead of making an outright admission of guilt, he added that, 
If anyone should ask for forgiveness, it was the Marxists, communists. He added that, as for his own part in the revolution, I feel like a patriotic angel. Augusto Pinochet died on December 10, 2006, at 2.15 p.m. He was under the treatment of Dr. Juan Ignacio Vergara and lived through only one week of hospitalization. During those final days, he underwent an angioplasty procedure and a separate operation following an acute heart attack. At the end, he suffered from multiple ailments that combined to weaken him further, including diabetes, arthritis, and heart disease. The three strokes he suffered in recent days left him with a mild form of dementia. Supporters gathered outside the hospital and, in a strange contrast, spent the day weeping and trading insults with the people in passing cars in front of the Santiago Hospital. In other sections of the city, street clashes broke out between opponents and the police, resulting in the use of tear gas, water cannons, and in a number of arrests. Some mark the day of Pinochet's death as particularly ironic, given that December 10th was also International Human Rights Day. At the time of his passing, two human rights cases and one charge of tax evasion against him were still pending. President Bachelet was not of a mind to offer Pinochet a state funeral. In her words, by honoring him in such a way, the conscience of Chileans would feel violated. And in general, the conservative view was that the former dictator died as a fugitive from justice. Much effort was spent in preventing the public from glamorizing the persona of the aged former president, or that of his infamous history, not as well known among the younger generation of the 21st century. Some still honored him as a savior of the country, even while others remembered him as an outright murderer, but for supporters, or those who thought kindly of him, Tata, or Grandfather, who had been largely out of the public eye, evoked some sympathy among a third of the public. His absence from public life and a perception that he was a devout Roman Catholic created a somewhat fictionalized sentiment for the aged dictator in some quarters. Daughter Inez Lucia, despite having been indicted for tax fraud and having sought political asylum in the United States, attended her father's funeral. She had on leaving Chile failed to respond to a legal summons, and a warrant was issued for her arrest when she crossed the border into Argentina. Deported by the U.S., she was sent back not to Chile but to Argentina as the last country of origin before entering the United States. The funeral featured a glass-covered casket by which more than 60,000 mourners slowly processed. Pinochet had pointedly asked the Chilean people to let history judge his legacy, but the split in devotion and hatred was clear across the country. Another 3,000 gathered to commemorate Salvador Allende, and the family requested that no one from the socialist government attend. Defense Minister Viviane Blanlot was the only attendee from the present regime, and she was booed loudly by Pinochet devotees for her presence. But Pinochet's youngest daughter, Jacqueline, helped to break the ice by shaking Blanlow's hand. Pinochet's body was taken by helicopter to an unknown location outside of Santiago for cremation following the service, over which the Archbishop of Santiago presided. It had always been a fear of Pinochet that if he were interred, elements of the left might desecrate his tomb. The Pinochet family still faced ongoing charges, but were allowed the respect of distance for the ceremony. Daughter Inez Lucia would in time overcome her legal difficulties with the Bachelet government and come back to seek a seat in Parliament. She eventually became a councilwoman of Vitacura, a conservative stronghold. Outside of Chile, the reaction was less mixed. The bent of the press and the public reactions made it clear that international society saw him as a criminal, not as the white-haired Tata surrounded by a loving family. Statements from foreign governments seemed strangely muted. South American states understood the controversy surrounding Pinochet and did not want to release any more information than necessary. This was especially true in the United States, where damning memorandums were being made public on the very day of Pinochet's burial. In December of 2006, the National Security Archive declassified U.S. documents that illumined the former dictator's record of repression. The Clinton administration revealed the minutes of secret meetings with Henry Kissinger, 
where the Secretary of State ratcheted up the pressure on the Chilean military to commit what were later called human atrocities by the nation's courts. Many of the most graphic actions taken behind the scenes of American government were later reproduced in Peter Kornblut's book The Pinochet File, a declassified dossier on atrocity and accountability. Kornblut was the director of the National Security Archive, a foremost expert on the Pinochet regime and responsible for declassifying important documents related to his part in the revolution. Although the Obama administration supported the declassifications, it had stopped short of an outright apology for U.S. complicity, terming it a difficult period. Despite that, the Obama administration went forward with a new wave of declassifications that clearly intimated that Pinochet directly ordered killings on U.S. soil, most notably the Letelier assassination. As the evidence deepens, more is learned of Kissinger's sentiments involving human rights abuses as an acceptable alternative to a strong Marxist presence in a neighboring nation. In a one-to-one -one meeting, Kissinger is known to have observed, Your greatest sin is that you overthrew a government that was going communist. He went on to assure the Chilean president by reminding him, As you know, we are sympathetic with what you are trying to do here. The end of the conversation involved a guarantee from the United States that no human rights sanctions would be forthcoming. The Reagan administration, not as overt as its counterpart of the early 70s, believed that Chile occupied a category of authoritarian states that could be worked with through quiet diplomacy. Reagan's assistant secretary of state met with Pinochet and walked away in disbelief about the man's unwillingness to compromise. He's the toughest nut I've ever seen. The politics of the Pinochet problem had far-reaching effects on U.S. foreign policy with other neighbors. To avoid any further delving into North American culpability, the U.S. pressured Britain to reject the extradition order to Spain. This was a quandary for the British, who had fought with the Americans in the Middle East but were allied with the Chileans in the Falklands. The claim has been made that by helping to extend the longevity of the Pinochet regime through secrecy, the United States delayed the advent of true democracy in Chile for decades. It is doubtful that the driving force behind Pinochet's ambition to leadership was something so commonplace as the life of a glory hound or libertine, as has been the case with many dictators. Whatever can be taken as purely authentic in his public statements, his rugged devotion to the greatness of the Chilean state, as he conceived it to be, is the most likely. He was adamant in declaring that he would never be found sacrificing my tradition to hand it to any other country. With a clear nod to what he perceived as the Marxist threat and imminent takeover. Chile, in his mind, must be independent and stand out from others on the continent, and he was clear that his efforts had no other goal than making Chile greater and avoiding its disintegration. In a Washington Post interview granted not long before his death, he accepted the likelihood that he would die an outcast in his own country. But this, despite its inherent sadness, was not the most important consideration. He poignantly remarked to the interviewer, I harbor no rancor against anybody. I love my fatherland above all. In more concrete terms, he summarized by saying that the harsh measures taken under his direction were justified by the violence of the opposition and the threat of civil war. Pinochet's eldest son has observed that, in his opinion, it will take future generations of people to understand my father and give him the place in history he deserves, a great man. The rejoinder to the younger Pinochet's sentiments is that for successive governments it will take years to catalogue the atrocities. Pinochet as a physical presence in cultural life has been largely erased as symbols of his regime fall. The September 11 Avenue in Santiago is now New Providence Avenue, and medals that bear his likeness have been altered. Congress debated a bill introduced by a communist lawmaker entitled No Street Will Bear Your Name. While a library bearing Pinochet's name still exists at the Military War Academy in Santiago, Bachelet allowed it to remain as an educational tool of Chile's history, rather than a promotion of one ideology or another, not trying to impose an interpretation of history, just recounting the facts. And yet some claim that although it commemorates the fallen heroes, 
The mistakes of the regime are unmentioned in an effort to sanitize the historical truth, and that none of it mitigates the inexcusable barbarity of Pinochet. With various memoirs published by soldiers and witnesses of the era, and with the release of revealing American documents, state secrets from Pinochet's era are shrinking rapidly, and as a cultural phenomenon, what were once sites devoted to torture and murder have become tourist attractions. Bachelet continued to reverse Pinochet-inspired legislation, such as labor laws that restrict the right to strike and heavily privatized education. Major alterations to the state constitution through the years go far beyond the rate of amendment in any other state on the continent, and to praise Pinochet openly in public carries the stigma of a national taboo. An outcry in the Congress broke out when a member requested a moment of silence for Pinochet on the eighth anniversary of his death. Furthermore, a dossier on General Ariano Stark, Pinochet's right-hand man, has since gone public and offered proof that Pinochet himself ordered the murders of twenty-one political prisoners during the caravan of death. With the public continuing as a split society on the Pinochet matter, he is regarded as a historical figure with neither tomb nor heirs. However, despite its reversal of fortunes, the Pinochet family has not abandoned the political life within areas of Chile where conservative popularity remains high. As of 2014, reports claim that Pinochet's grandson was forming his own political party based on the principles of conservative-style patriotism and an anti-gay platform. However suppressed the expression of support for Pinochet is within Chile and outside it, it continues to exist in one form or another. For example, one analyst cites what he perceives as the exaggerated vitriol devoted to the revolution compared with other historical upheavals. The blatantly disproportionate allotment of wrath focused on this man. William Jasper of the National Observer sought to remind readers that Pinochet is not in history's major rogues gallery, because he has never been forgiven by communists for that heroic act of overthrowing them. In his statement that had there been a Pinochet leading in 1918 Russia, or in Germany of 1933, the people would have been better off, he claimed that the deaths of innocents were largely the communists' fault. Pinochet, says George Reisman of Mises Wire, is no angel, no soldier can be, but he was certainly no devil. Conservatives share a deep belief that Allende was guilty of massive electoral fraud, and that his administration was packed with Serbians, Soviets, international communists. Some suggest that in the coup, once supported by the Chilean people, Pinochet actually acted with restraint. Conservative writers point out that although Pinochet inflicted some necessary personal damage, many of those who died or suffered were preparing to inflict a far greater number of deaths and a vastly larger scale of suffering on their fellow citizens in a hostile leftist takeover. A mainstream conservative talking point suggests that the actual power that Pinochet possessed from the time of the coup through the establishment of the new constitution has been grossly overestimated, and that he never attained the supremacy attributed to him. The viewpoint further claims that the commanders of the assisting branches within the junta retained significant powers, and this viewpoint was actually echoed by a comment Pinochet made while being detained in 1998, that he was only an aspiring dictator, I was never a real dictator. Moreover, it is widely felt that Marxists, who claim that the miracle of Chile was of a shallow nature, a fact revealed by its eventual collapse, are not only denying the fact of Pinochet's rescue of the economy, but camouflaging their ideology's basic flaws in the pursuit of economic health. The process of forgiveness, unable to move forward due to lack of remorse and official admissions, has otherwise proceeded only through the passing of generations and natural changes in political sensibilities. Protests in 2015 at the arrival of the Esmeralda in Britain for the Tall Ships exhibition, for example, clearly suggest that although information has come down from national archives, public questions at the grassroots level have yet to be answered. As one protester suggests, 
It is unjust to expect victims to forgive and forget when the perpetrators do not express regret and remorse. In ongoing requests for an official apology from the United States, the administration will not comply, simply suggesting that old conflicts have receded, a theory of questionable substance. Writer Jorge Edwards, however, points to milestones of progress on several fronts and advises that to move forward may require a wise dose of memory and forgetfulness. At least, says Edwards, the case of Pinochet has pointed toward the end of impunity for heads of state by cutting off the global escape routes that were available in past eras. He adds that luxurious vacations paid for with state millions may give way to internal exile enforced by the world's judges. Chile itself was greatly changed as it entered the 21st century. The country still had few female politicians at that time. But a notable one was Isabel Allende Bussi, the socialist president's daughter. Bussi has held a powerful position as president of the Senate and represented a powerful symbol of progress. Some of those given charge of old cases look back with bitterness. Human rights lawyer Hugo Gutierrez despaired, This criminal has departed without ever being sentenced for all the acts. However, as a sign of encouragement to those who look forward, the judiciary has demonstrated a proactive and successful stance in addressing former wrongs. Chile's judges, in fact, have sentenced more former officials of the military regime for human rights violations than any other country in Latin America. Nothing could prevail upon Pinochet in life to alter his viewpoint toward the left versus right conflict. Certainly nothing can be done to change it after his passing. As a rare political and military phenomenon, it is said that Chile never produced in nearly two centuries of independence a man with more acute political nose or one with more talent for intrigue. Pinochet's remark that people considered him a dictator because he had a sour face represents a style of glibness with which he minimized and deflected the consequences of his action. Such a comment, however, is a mere symptom of personality and does not represent a core belief from which modern Chile must move forward. Rather, it is another of his remarks, one he made often to heads of state presiding over his era, and one that must be disproven and dispelled before the new culture of Chile can truly forget. Sometimes democracy must be bathed in blood. This has been Augusto Pinochet, The Life and Legacy of Chile's Controversial Dictator, written by Charles River Editors, narrated by Kenneth Ray. Copyright 2016 by Charles River Editors. Production Copyright 2017 by Charles River Editors. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.